Smashing. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Licensing Committee. My name is James Gibson, and I'm the chair of the Licensing Committee. Um, we're now being live streamed. I just want to remind everybody of that. Um, and if we just go around now, members, please and introduce ourselves from the left. Councillor Martin. Hello, I'm Councillor Lisa Martin, and I represent Round Haywood. Luke Farley, Labour Councillor for Burma, Tofton, Richmond Hill. Good morning, Isaac Wilson, Councillor for Wheatwood. Good morning, Al Garthwaite, Councillor for Headingley Hyde Park and Woodhouse. Good morning, Councillor Sharon Hamilton, representing Maltown and Meanwood Ward. Councillor Anne Forsyth, Farning, Wortley Ward. Councillor Rick Downs, Otley and Eden Ward. Good morning, Councillor Linda Richards from Weatherby Ward. Councillor Neil Buckley from Old Woodley Ward. Uh, good morning, Billy Flynn, Councillor Dunn, Wharfdale Ward. Thank you very much, members. Uh, I'll ask the clerk now to introduce um, items one to five, please. Thank you, Chair. Under agenda item number one, there are no appeals against refusal of inspection of documents. Agenda item two, the agenda contains no exempt information today. Agenda item three, there are no late items of business added to the agenda. Uh, agenda item number four, do members have any declarations of interest they'd like to make? None, thank you. Um, and agenda item number five, I've received apologies for absence from Councillor Hutchison today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, agenda item number six then, which is the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 24th of January, 2023. Do members accept these minutes as a true and accurate record? Yes, Councillor Garthwaite. Yes, I did give my apologies, but I'm in paragraph 42. I'm not noted as having given my apologies. Thank you. I'll make sure that's right. Thanks. And up. No. no problem. <laughs> okay, other than that uh, amendment, which we will correct, um, I'll assume that they were correct unless anybody else indicates otherwise. Yes, Helen. Apologies, Chair. Um, under agenda, under minutes number 44 relating to the Leeds Festival, members will recall that there was a discussion about setting up um, a working group to do with sustainability um, and the environmental impact of the festival. Um, and colleagues are seeking um, any volunteers who'd like to make an expression of interest to join in that if possible today. Yeah. Any other volunteers for that, for the uh, Leeds Festival Working Group? Councillor Wilson, I thought you have already volunteered. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you what, put your hands up now. If, you've, even if you're even if you unsure if you've volunteered or not, put your hands up now and then we can log you. Okay. That's so one, two, three, no, four. Hamilton, you did. Okay. Smashing. Thank you. About five. Thank you very much. Okay. So we'll now move on to agenda item number seven, which is the Licensing Annual Report 2022. Um, the committee has received a licensing annual report for information and discussion prior to it being presented to Council on the 22nd of March. The report details the work of both the entertainment license section and the taxi and private hire licensing section. I'd like to hand over to John first, please, who's going to introduce our new member of the team. Thanks very much, Chair. Yes, if I could just take a moment of the committee's time to introduce Jason Singh to you all. Uh, he's new taxi and private hire licensing manager. Jason's role is slightly wider than just taxi and private hire licensing. Uh, he's also uh, taken on the role of head of service for parking services in our area and will be taking a lead in some city centre organisational uh, arrangements as well, which includes uh, the cleaner neighbourhoods team for the city centre. So Jason has quite a wide remit. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to introduce him and welcome him to the committee on behalf of you all. Thank you, John. And the very warmest of welcomes uh, from all of us here at the Licensing Committee too, Jason. If we can now go um, down and officers can introduce themselves from Sue onwards, please. Thank you, Chair. My name is Sue Duckworth. I work in entertainment licensing. Morning. Nicola Ray from entertainment licensing. Morning, everybody. Jason Singh, I'm the head of service covering taxi licensing. Thank you. Would somebody like to introduce the report? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll introduce the report, then I'll hand over to colleagues to uh, present the, the detail, Chair. The report, quite simply, is a uh, usual annual report. This particular report covers uh, the months of 2022, from January to December, so all the statistical information within the report is for that period of time. Um, it covers both... Um, entertainment licensing and taxi and private hire licensing gives a summary of performance with statistics uh, for members uh, to uh, read and ask questions about uh, and Sue Duckworth will provide a uh, overview of the entertainment licensing part of the report and Jason Singh will provide an overview of the taxi and um, private hire licensing part of the report so if I can hand over to Sue now chair Kick on, John. I just comment as well that um, I hope that the entertainment licensing team watched the full council um, last well, last month now, and uh, and all the comments that uh, from the licensing committee that were very warm and grateful for all the great work that you've been doing. But I'll uh, hand over to you now. Thank you, Chair. And yes, we did. And uh, yes, we made all the staff watch it, and they were very, very moved. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so on to the annual report. Um, I won't keep you very long. I just wanted to point out a, a few uh, things that uh, show that we are still um, dealing with the uh, fallout from the pandemic. So if you look at page seven, the number of applications that we received in 2021 and 2022, you will see in 2021 received 194 um, applications for premises licenses. Uh, this was a higher than normal figure, and we felt that this was a rebound from 2020. The figure of 170 that we dealt with in 2022 is more normal. Um, if we turn the page to the community of impact uh, policy areas, you will see that um, we had a number go through for Headingley High Park, Hare Hills and Armley. The ones for Armley I just wanted to explain because normally we would bring all applications for Armley to a, a, a licensing subcommittee. The two that were agreed with conditions, one was for a new premises license for a non-license, which we felt was to be encouraged. And the second one was for a new application, but the applicant varied his application in such a way that his application didn't actually change his original license at all. So it went through with conditions agreed, but that was because there was actually no real decision to be made on that. You'll see that the um, from the other two, one was refused and one was pending as we turned the year. Um, if I can uh, direct you to the temporary event notice figures, um, you'll see that we had a, a large jump um, between 2021 and 2022. We doubled the number of temporary event notices we were dealing with. That's still below normal. We would normally deal with around 1,500 a year. So we're still a little bit under our, our normal levels. Um, and then just moving on to complaint handling on page 13. Uh, members will have noted that the 2022 figures for um, unlicensed activity and basically noise complaints have more than doubled. And we do believe that this is um, in uh, direct correlation with the uh, pandemic and uh, people um, being less uh, tolerant of noise in their neighbourhoods. And this is probably because they're, they've experienced two years of much reduced noise. Uh, we're expecting those complaints to, to, to regularise. Uh, part of this might be the increase in outside drinking that we have since we've had a regulatory easement on off sales. Uh, a lot of people are now using their outside spaces and we expect that to continue. I think um, a lot of the businesses have, have enjoyed using their outside spaces and, and we feel that we're supporting business by doing that, but it does mean that we will have to deal with a slightly higher than uh, usual level of noise complaints, which, which our enforcement team are, are dealing with. Um, and then finally, just on page 15, looking forward to future projects for 2023, we will be reviewing the Armory and uh, Dewsbury Road areas in relation to community of impact. Certainly in our consultation last year, um, we were asked to extend the Armley Community Impact Area, which we will be looking at uh, this summer. And we have had a long standing agreement with members in South Leeds that we will look at Dewsbury Road again. T to be honest, we did look 
a, a number of years ago and we couldn't justify a community of impact area at that time, but it's timely that, that we should review that now. So that's our plan for 2023. Um, I don't know if we want to take questions at the end. Yeah, so then I'll pass over to Jason. Licensing and then questions and then taxing private hire licensing. Sorry, I thought you had more, so. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was really useful. Uh, questions? Councillor Downs. Thanks, Chair. Just um, on page 23, it says appeals in the table at the bottom, appeals none. Am I understanding that that means that we've had no uh, appeals against licensing decisions? Or what does that none mean there? I don't believe we had any appeals in 2022. We are dealing with a number now this year, though. Right, because that's, so that's three consecutive years we've had no appeals against yeah. any of the councillors' decisions. Yes, wow. and but we are dealing with a we're dealing with two this year. So yes, they're bouncing back. I believe that is also pandemic. We made a, we took a lot less decisions over the last two years. Yeah, I can continue on, Chair. Um, um, on the Hare Hills um, CIA, slightly higher up, uh, it says um, the first item, licence refused at hearing and subsequently appealed. Um, what was the result of that appeal? Um, it's not clear from the document what the result of the appeal was. Uh, that's the one that's ongoing. So that will be heard in July. Unfortunately, again, as a result of the pandemic, um, the uh, court cases are taking uh, an extended amount of time to be dealt with. So we're still, do, still dealing with those. That, that's fine, Chair. Last last part, point. Um, and I just wonder whether it's possible to reflect that in the report that to clarify that that one is outstanding. Um, and finally, the... Um, Film classification policy, it says work is underway to formalise and update the current process. Um, does that include, and is it worth mentioning or is it not worth mentioning, but just so that members are aware that it may be possible to do them remotely? Because um, for a council that lives in Otley to drive in to review one film for five minutes and then drive back out to Otley, it's not very good for the environment. Yes, it is our preference uh, to... Um do more film classifications remotely it makes perfect sense especially as uh, the uh, promoters are often traveling from an extended distance as well to, to come for a five minute uh, discussion however we do have a small hiccup in the constitution whereby we can't do remote hearings at the moment so we need to resolve that first and then yeah absolutely we're, that's our intention that's the way we'd like to go Thank you. And I'll just reinforce that we're, we're definitely working towards that. And, and you serve as a perfect example as to why we should be doing remote uh, hearings for film classifications. Uh, thank you for that. OK, Councillor Underworth. OK, if we, if we can just take note, if uh, yeah, if you can give the page numbers. Have you got the uh, a physical copy with you because they're numbered differently? Have we got any spares? <laughs> yeah. Just so people can make sure that we're literally all on the same page. Councillor Garthwaite now, please. Yes, thank you. Um, the first, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is on page five of the report, but page 21 in the numbered pages of the whole, um, the whole document. And it comes just at the end of the first paragraph under the heading coronavirus pandemic. It says that um, customers who have come back to enjoy the nighttime economy have different priorities and it is taking some time for businesses to adjust. I wondered what those different priorities are. Um, it goes on that that um, section to talk about poor behaviour, but I don't imagine anyone has a priority to go and behave poorly. So I wondered what exactly was meant by that. <laughs> Yes, so uh, 
there are different behaviour standards uh, as we've come out of the pandemic. Um, it's really difficult to analyse why. But I've, I've done quite a lot of research into uh, behavioural change around uh, global events, um, and it's quite it's well established that people um, re-entering into society after a, a, a global event like this do have uh, different behaviour. Some of that can be around um, a feeling of entitlement, of, of wanting, of, of feeling as though that they have a right to be out and about because they've been restricted so long, and this is sometimes at, at odds with um, the bar staff and the door staff, and so there have been some issues around that kind of behaviour standard. That's basically where we were coming from. Um, and as I say, in, in the, as we go on to explain in the next paragraph. Um, it, the, the priority for the customers is that they want to go out and have a good time, regardless of the impact on other people, including residents and so on. And I think that's been very clearly shown in the difficulties we're experiencing headingly, whereas it's almost people's priority is that they will have a good time regardless because they've been restricted for so long. Yes, I totally agree with that. And um, I know that. Unfortunately, I see what you mean. Um, my other point was on page 12 of this report, page 28 in the printed documents. And there's a list, I'm just finding it, of um, multi-agency liaison, which is, is very useful. But could we add the um, end violence against women and girls working group for the city centre to that list because I know you yourself have been a very valuable member of that and it is something in light of all the reports of sexual harassment and assault and so on by women that come that um, is very important for licensing to be well aware of as you know. <coughs> Thank you very much for that. Councillor Garthway. Councillor Forsyth, please. Right, thank you. Um, still on page 12. Um, this is for information, really. Um, the safety advisory group, I was wondering what the remit of that is. Could you just clarify, um, please? It, do they only help with outdoor events and only for licensed sensible activities? No, the safety, well, partially, the safety advisory group um it's coordinated by um the Res resilience and emergency team within Leeds city council but it involves a lot of stakeholders both internal and external to the council and we use a secure plat platform called resilience direct for sharing all event information documents but it's not necessarily just licensed events it could be community events marathons etc um, even demonstrations and marches through the city centre. So it, it, it they maintain a diary of all events throughout Leeds and the district, which all agencies have access to. And so it can inform um, police resources, highways, road closures, et cetera, et cetera. But it is a really good tool for out for the purpose of our licensed events, because that's where the event organisers upload their event management plans. Um, and then the if you like the multi-agency meetings, they're coordinated through the safety advisory group. Thank you, Councillor Forsyth. Councillor Flynn, do you want to come in now or at the end of the full report? Yeah, okay. yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. It's it's probably not for discussion today, but um, I had sort of concerns about the um, uh, three areas, really. It was the medical cover, crime and disorder and public safety. Um, there were concerns uh, of various sort of levels raised at the debrief that we had here a couple of months or so ago. Um, and uh, I learned to my surprise that the command and control of the event is actually the responsibility of Festival Republic uh, and that we sort of serve an advisory sort of capacity and, and oversee it by way of the resilience, uh, the Emergency Resilience Committee and the Safety Advisory Group. Um, but given the concerns that were raised, um, I, I think uh, there, these are issues that need to be discussed by the working group that uh, Helen mentioned before. Uh, and I would also like to have members of the resilience team and the safety advisory group uh, present at those meetings. Um, a condition of the event is that we are supposed to see the event management plan in advance. And we didn't see it or we didn't see the final version of it because it wasn't ready. 
um, and it was, uh, I think, passed down to officers to agree, and they did do. Um, this is the condition of this festival, and it's a condition of this festival that this committee actually passes it, uh, and I want to see it um, in full and complete and finalised before we uh, give our go-ahead for, for this year's festival. So I'll raise different issues at the... Um, at the, the smaller group that we want to have here, but I have considerable concerns about some of the points that were raised, particularly by the Yorkshire Ambulance Service, about what happened at last year's festival or what didn't happen. Thank you. Councillor Flynn, uh, thank you very much for that. And I will allow uh, entertainment licensing to, to come back and answer the question about the event management plan. As for the other things, everything sounds reasonable. And we also share, I certainly share your concerns as well. Um, and, and they were raised at the last uh, full licensing committee as well as at the um, uh, at the debrief as well. So um, I think we need to, to carry on uh, working with Festival Republic and partner agencies and make sure that the concerns that we have uh, are addressed. And I think you're quite right to raise them. Event management plan then, please, Nicola, if you'd like to comment. The event management plan, it's no longer held by the by ourselves. Um, it'll be uploaded onto Res Resilience Direct, as I've just mentioned. And so what I can do is liaise with the um, controller of that platform to provide members with access to the event management plan. Can we not? Is there no way of printing it? No, Chair, I'm afraid not. It's due to data protection. Is the Councillor Fred gone? Um, it, it is a condition. Um, of, of the event taking place that this committee sees the event management plan and we didn't see it last year for, for reasons that we needn't go into now uh, i know john uh, cleared it and i have no concerns at all about uh, the way it was actually done last year it should be and must be presented to this committee before that event takes place next year can we have a look can we have a look at ways of which we can do that we need to have a, a explore i don't expect you to answer now um but you know and, and know off the top of your head how an it system works especially since it's not one of our it systems but if we can have a look into it and then get back to councillor flynn and myself that would be great yes certainly thank Jeff. you Thanks, Jason. I'll hand over to uh, you and the Taxi and Private Hire Licensing team. Welcome, team, as well. Nice to see you all here, and uh, great that you're supporting Jason today. And I'll hand over. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, um, very good to be here, and uh, pleased to meet you all. I'd just like to introduce Phil Arnett. He's our Quality and Standards Manager at Taxi and Private Hire Licensing. Uh, Richard Perry is our Operations Manager, and. Uh, Valence Jacobs is our licensing and finance manager. Um, so the annual report that uh, is in front of you members recognises the uh, significant efforts and determination of, of drivers, operators and our staff um, as we continue to recover from COVID as a city and also restore passenger taxi travel to levels closer to pre-COVID levels, but obviously we're not there yet. Um, so I'll just pick out some key aspects of the report and then I'm sure you have questions. So in terms of page 16, which is page 32 of the pack, uh, the report sets out how we utilised funds from the COVID economic development budget. That was worth some 2.1 million in total to licence holders by way of grants. These funds were used to offer a free year licence worth £390 for existing drivers. And the initiative was um, received very really positively by our trade colleagues. Page 17 of the report, and that's page 33 of the pack, um, talks about the vehicle's emissions and free licensing grants. So whilst we um, don't have a clean air zone, we have still retained um, some ability to, to make grants available through the Clean Air Fund um, in our efforts to help shift um, colleagues in the trade from diesel and petrol to 
um, 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 low emission vehicles. And um, 80, over 1,800 owners um, took up this offer uh, of a grant of over 600 pounds in total. Um, and that was 1.1 million uh, was allocated in this last year. So once again, another positive effort by the team. Um, the trend has continued away from diesel and petrol vehicles towards low emission ones. Um, 3,000 of our 4,300 odd vehicles um, on our petrol hybrid. We have a further 129 um, electric or LPG vehicles. So that's, um, that's, that's something that's really positive. Um, page 18 of the reports, which is page 34 of the pack, um, talks about enforcement and compliance that was undertaken in this last year. Um, and you'll see uh, from those figures that um, a total of uh, 1,187 vehicles were inspected by our enforcement teams. Our enforcement teams uh, operate seven days a week, 24 hours, practically. So it's, a, it's quite an extensive um, compliance operation. Um, and um, there's some further information um, on page 20 of the pack, which is um, page 30, so page 36 of the pack um, in relation to refusals uh, and revocation decisions. Some of those relate to enforcement and compliance. In terms of licensing and applications, which uh, are discussed on page 35 of the pack, um, in the second half of 2022, we processed 326 licensing applications and over 400 new vehicles were listed. 3,600 vehicle inspections have been carried out this year by the garage team managed by Phil. Uh, however, driver and vehicle application numbers do remain lower than 2020 levels. Um, and driver applications have actually reduced in the city and, and that's shown in the figures. This is a national trend as drivers uh, moved away uh, into other areas during the pandemic and some have not returned. Um, Happy to take any questions on that. Looking forward, um, Chair, um, members of the committee will, will be aware that we've announced um, the commencement of the vehicle and conditions review. Um, and we have our first meeting of the working group next week on the 20th. And we'll be looking um, to meet with um, trade and user groups um, between now and the end of July. Um, and to hopefully start addressing some of the most pressing and challenging issues we face in terms of getting a wider range of vehicles onto our fleet safely, but with more flexibility, and also to meet the diverse needs of the users that we have in the city, particularly those that are using wheelchair accessible vehicles. And I think the other thing just to point out is that we've introduced, we will be reintroducing the programmed regular meetings with the trade. Um, I think realistically that will be up to the election now, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jason, for that. Councillor yeah. Down, please. Thanks, Chair. Just one small one. On um, page 17 of the report, page 33 of the pack, um, on the bottom table for vehicle inspections, it says um, of the 3,646 inspections, there are only six vehicles which failed to meet the minimum standard. This amounts to 1.6% of the total inspections. It doesn't. It's either 0.16 or there were 60 cars that failed, which was it? Chair, I believe the percentage is wrong. Uh, apologies for that, um, but we will check that before um, the report goes any further. Okay, if I can just come back, Chair, very briefly. If it is just six vehicles, that's um, an incredible credit to the trade that of that number of vehicles, only six failed to meet the minimum standard. Thank you. We're going to come back and write into that. Will do, Chair. Yeah. Councillor so Martin now, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, page 22 of the report, page 38 of the bundle, um, please. Um, so this is about um, complaints received, and I'm, I'm looking in particular about the disability complaints um, and I just I would just like you to tell us some more about what those complaints are, because I noticed that there is an upturn in complaints that, um, from that area. So I'm guessing from from users who've got disabilities 
Um, and I'm guessing that that's an underreporting of of issues that faced by that group. So um, I'd just like to, to to hear more about what those complaints are about, and to hear some reassure, reassurance about what um, the service is doing to address those, please. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Martin. Um, so. <laughs> So off the top of my head, obviously, I'm not able to go into the, the details of each of those complaints. We've got a wide range of reasons why users um, and um, and um, um, passengers may choose to complain about the service that they've received. Um, so we can give you um, a further breakdown in relation to the nature of those disability complaints, Councillor Martin, uh, in, in writing, if that's OK. Thank you. Um, I was... I'd just like you to go on to say what action the service is taking in relation to um, complaints from disabled users. Yeah, so, Councillor Martin, apologies for the delay there, just uh, getting a bit of a briefing from Richard. Um, I, we, we always use our full range of, of, of compliance powers um, that we have um, in relation to uh, specific complaints. Um, and we'd obviously um, use those proportionately and, and, and apply those, whether it's um, operators or drivers, um, um, if we feel that that's appropriate. Um, once again, I can I can outline what actions, specific actions and and what we what we have done in response to those particular disability complaints to you. Okay, so thanks. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I must say that I have seen uh, look been had sight of a complaint that's come in and has been dealt very well by the team. So I have got confidence that when complaints are coming in, that they are being dealt with. Um, if we can get some more detail for Councillor Martin about you know some of the. But perhaps if we um, make them anonymous and, and so she's got a good picture about the process about how we complain, uh, we um, deal with complaints when they come in, that would be really useful. Um, if we go to Councillor Flynn now, then, please. James, um, about uh, enforcement and compliance, uh, Jason, page 34. Um, most of the complaints I hear from the trade are, are about cross-bordering and uh, effectively applying for hire. Um, just looking at the number of inspections that uh, the officers carried out, only 25% of them, I think, were uh, are vehicles from outside of Leeds. Um, and while our vehicles are considered, as I understand it anyway, to be in, in better nick than most other authorities because of the conditions that we sort of lay down. Um, I don't know how many modern vehicles sort of come into the city, but... Um, it seems to be every other taxi, every other private hire car I see seems to have a foreign plate on. Um, I just wonder why only a quarter of the, or at least I don't know if it's a quarter or whether it's a fifth, of the vehicles that were inspected were from other authorities rather than our own. I've got to come back as well. I'll just make clear to the public that are watching that when we say foreign, when you say foreign, you mean you mean from different licensing authorities. Yeah. We're not getting people from different countries applying for hire in Leeds. In relation to the number of checks that we do on the vehicles that are out and about, we have a team of enforcement officers that are working uh, seven nights a week on alternative rolling dates. Uh, we do attempt to check as many vehicles as we can when we're out and about. Uh, we do work closely with the other areas, the other authorities. Uh, when, we, when we're approaching these vehicles from other authorities, we don't always get the same level uh, of appreciation from these drivers. Uh, but we are working very closely to uh, get as many checks done as we can on these vehicles from out of areas because obviously they're serving the public of late. Yeah, I, I know it's impossible to tell how many vehicles come from other licensing authorities into Leeds, um, but I'm told there are hundreds, if not thousands, that actually come across. Um, and uh, I, I, I just wonder again, uh, is it your um, view that uh, there are far more Leeds taxis operating in Leeds. And by taxis, I mean private hire or, um, or, or um, 
hackney carriages than there are from other authorities. At this moment in time, uh, I would say that the majority of the vehicles working in Leeds are Leeds licensed vehicles, both private hire and hackney carriage. However, we have seen a significant increase in the last three to four years. And I would say that uh, we're potentially getting an increase every year on the number of vehicles from other authorities due to the deregulation act that they can, like, can legally work in Leeds, unfortunately. Looking at the um, the various sort of um, penalties that were were applied, um, it does it does talk about applying for hire, but I can't see which specifically in the figures that you've given us are applying for hire. In 2022, we uh, prosecuted eight drivers for applying for hire. Uh, that, that's down in the uh, complaints and the, the revocations. And uh, these drivers were convicted and they were revoked uh, as, as a result of being convicted for applying for hire. Were they Leeds drivers or were they from other authorities? I'm unable to get, tell you exactly the numbers, but I can tell you that there was drivers prosecuted from other authorities as well as Leeds. Would you just remind me what, what act it was that brought in um, cross-bordering? It was the uh, Deregulation Act 2015. Thank you for that. Forsyth, please. Right, thank you. Um, so I'm referring on page 17 to the vehicle emissions. Um, it, it, it's obviously good that there were some retained funds from the Clean Air Fund to continue to give grants, um, but I find it qu quite disappointing uh, about the differential between the petrol hybrid and the full electric vehicles, because there's quite a difference between low emissions and zero emissions in terms of our, our climate emergency response, really. Um, so I'm wondering if whether, well, first question is whether you are giving equivalent grants for both petrol hybrid and full electric and whether you've got any, any understanding as to why um, the drivers might be opting for the, for the petrol hybrid as well. And the second question is how long will these grants be available, do you consider? <clears throat> The, the the grant uh, was given to um, uh, the, the same granted to all vehicles, uh, whether they were uh, LPG, uh, full electric, or uh, hybrid. Um, one of the other initiatives that was introduced was uh, to change the vehicle edge criteria uh, to encourage people to get um, ultra low emission vehicles which moved from five years to seven years. Uh, we will continue uh, to find ways to uh, encourage uh, proprietors to get uh, ultra low emission as a part of the vehicle condition that Jason has referred to, uh, which will be undertaking um, uh, very, very shortly. Right. Can, can I just come back on that one? I mean, as I, as I pointed out, the, the low emissions is very different from the zero emissions. And it's also with, for the electric vehicles as well. It's where the electricity is generated as well, which is a, another consideration. I just wondered whether that might might have been possible to be looked at in any sort of remit. That was all. Yeah. Going forward, Councillor Forsyth, yes, we'll, we'll certainly bear that in mind as we undertake the vehicle and conditions review. Obviously, cost is a significant factor here in terms of cost of vehicles. We're very conscious that the trade um, will make its commercial decisions based on the cost of vehicles that are appearing on the market. Um, and I know this cost differential between hybrid and, and fully electric vehicles. Um, but we will take note of your points and and uh, consider that as part of the review and, and, and our approach. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Garthwaite, please. Yes, my, I was also going to ask about the um, vehicle emissions and the licensing grant. Certainly, I agree it's extremely 
um, encouraging that so many have changed to lower emission. And I imagine that the fact that a taxi might be asked to go right outside of Leeds to Huddersfield or even Manchester Airport or something and be concerned about the amount of charge left on an electric battery might well be a quite a large factor in their decision to go for hybrid. But of course, as these things change and electric vehicles on the lower price range get more and more battery power, this will probably change. So I think it's a gradual change myself. Um, I don't know if you agree, but also I just wondered, um, wanted to confirm that the grant is still available. Yeah. Uh, the, the grant is no longer uh, available. Uh, the grant was available from uh, uh, 1st of March 2022, and that sc scheme was run for uh, 12 months. Um, I think, as we mentioned, we were able to contact or to identify uh, 2,277 vehicle which was compliant, um, but unfortunately, only 1,843 proprietors uh, took the the, the, the grant. Um, the the uh, uh, as a part of the vehicle condition review, we will identify other ways of uh, encouraging uh, people to change to uh, ultra low emission vehicles. But unfortunately, there is no grant available for the time being. Hamilton then please. Thanks Chair. Um, my question is regard page 37 number 21 at the top. Um, can you just explain to me um, with regards it says two times standards of driving 27 points. Uh, um, how do you get up two drivers get 27 points? Uh, do taxi drivers have extra points? or can can um have more points than than normal drivers because i'm sure um they would have been disqualified when somebody goes to court and it's not just taxi driver it's any person they can uh, put a plea in of exceptional hardship uh, at court and the court may choose not to disqualify them when they hit 12 points, but they may still choose to give them uh, the penalty points on their license. Uh, and that's how somebody can get in excess of 12 points and not be disqualified. Chair, just one more. Um, <laughs> just on the suspension, um, um, where it says um, sexual offences, in 2019, we had 11. Um, just call it just pre-pandemic, there were 16. Obviously, during the pandemic, there was only three. So is, is for me, is that increasing again? Because 2022 is 11 in there. So um, what are we doing to try and clamp down? I mean, <laughs> what, what can we do to, because to me, it looks like it's going up again. I think you can see that there was a significant increase in 2022 from 2021. Obviously, in 2021, there wasn't the number of journeys due to the pandemic. Uh, I think you can say that 2022 was the first real year of returning back to normal for the journeys that were travelling. Uh, if you if you look back to 2020, we had 16 on that year. In 2019, we had uh, 11. Uh, it does appear to be the same sort of figures pre-pandemic where we're at there. We are working closely with the operators. Uh, we're, we're working closely with the drivers. We, we're training the drivers. We're having safeguarding training with the drivers. Uh, we're reminding of the responsibilities. And we're also getting a literature out there through the operators to the public to make sure that they know how to report matters of any concern to either the operators or to the taxi private air licensing service. Okay, just thanks for that, because um, I, I have had, um, just before pre-pandemic um, complaint regarding that, and it's very upsetting and distressing. And um, um, obviously they were asking, oh, um, we've got things in place to try and reduce it. And that's why I'm a bit concerned that it looks like it's creeping up again. 
fully understand your concerns, Council, and we will do everything that we can to, to work towards that. Councillor Buckley, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> this is page 33, and it's a reference to uh, petrol hybrid vehicles. And I could be completely wrong on this um, and tell me if I am, but I'm sure I read somewhere in the press in all the coverage of this that along with petrol and diesel cars, that petrol hybrid were also going to be phased out. Is that something I've got completely wrong? I, I couldn't really confirm either way, Councillor Buckley. Uh, you know, I can I can make inquiries and, and come back to you. It would be helpful because it seems to me that obviously there's a massive shift here to petrol hybrid vehicles, which on the face of it is a good thing. But if they're going to be phased out at some point, um, it would be uh, good to know so that they're not left holding the baby. We're not minuting, minuting that. I'll go to, but thank you. Uh, Councillor Forsyth, please. Um, yes, another a point that's not, this isn't in the report, actually, is um, there doesn't seem generally to have been much flagging up of the new highway code that came into force last January. Has that been flagged up at all? Because it's quite there's been some quite big changes, really, in terms of the hustle hierarchy of users and what the rights of pedestrians and, and cyclists. I just wonder whether that's been any part of your work or would be any part of your remit in terms of the uh, the um, private hire vehicles. Um, part of my role is I actually look after new driver training and uh, current driver training, and we did introduce uh, in our. Uh, we call it professional standards part of training. We have introduced um, more around the highway code and the tier system around cyclists and pedestrians, et cetera. So it is something that we did look into and we are doing in as part of the, the training. We also do use it when we are doing our uh, retraining and development training for existing drivers as well. So it is something we have taken on board and we are doing. All right, good. Thank you very much. Okay, members, any more questions for the Taxi and Private Hire licensing team? No? Yes, Councillor Carthwaite. Yeah, just going back to the hybrid vehicles, a quick search on Google tells me that hybrid vehicles are not being phased out. And it says, in fact, the technology behind hybrid vehicles is evolving and improving, allowing for better performance and fuel economy. Um, this is you know, what you read on the internet, but... Um, I assume, and also I I seem to remember being told once that um, the average life of a vehicle used for taxi and private hire is five years, and the cessation of production of diesel anyway for new ones is 2030. So even buying one now, a new one, at whatever cost, would have ceased to probably be still in service by the year 2030. And the technology is evolving all the time and hopefully the price is going down and any cost of repairs as well. I think we acknowledge, thank you for that comment, but it was a cursory search on Google. Um, so we're not gonna take it as, as read and we'll ask the uh, licensing team to get back to us with, with more detailed information. Councillor Buckley, do you want to further comment? Just briefly, it says on Google uh, they have a they have a stay of execution until twenty thirty five. 
We're all going back and forth using Google. Can we just get, we'll get an answer from the licensing team, okay? If that's okay. If there's any other questions about this, I'm not going to take them. <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> otherwise we'll just be sat here on our phones, you know, looking through Wikipedia and going toe to toe and it's no good. Right. Um, any other questions, please? Okay. In that case, thank you very much, private um, taxi and private hire licensing team, for your time, um, and we'll look forward to those answers that you've that you said you'll get back to us for um, in the future. I think we've got an, any other business that I'd like to bring up if um, if members could indicate whether or not they're happy with with the suggestion that I'm going to make. So we've had a you, you'll would have seen that we've had a number of emails come in um to us all with regards to uh dual operators so for the public at the moment uh and please correct me if i'm wrong team that um taxis are no sorry private tire vehicles are only able to register with one operator is that right yes that's correct <laughs> thank you so uh we've received emails that uh, from from some uh private hire um, drivers that they would like us to consider whether or not we should allow them to register with more than one operator. Now, obviously, we're working currently working on our vehicle conditions review, but I have to talk to the uh, to the team, and we're pretty confident that we could have a um, a review or a smaller review on this particular issue. Of course, it does fall into the part of the the wider driver. Uh, policy review and we won't be reviewing the whole driver policy but we were just reviewing this particular item since there is we've received such an interest from from drivers so that i'm proposing that alongside or con concomitant with the uh, vehicle conditions review we'll also have a review into the possibility of drivers being able to register with more than one operator can members indicate whether they're happy for that review Okay, nobody's saying no. Councillor Ellingworth, do you want to speak? Yeah. Okay, smashing. So we'll crack on with that in earnest. Yes, Councillor Buckley. I, I agree. Yes, we, we should be doing it because there are drivers coming into Leeds now who are working for more than one operator, but they've been licensed sort of elsewhere. Um, but it brings into a question a number of sort of issues around, um, uh, as I understand it, the, the contract of a passenger is with the operator and not with the driver. Um, and there are all kinds of sort of legal sort of issues around that. And I, if we're going to look at this, I think we need to look at the legal side of it as well. Absolutely. We need to look at the legal side of it. And I think what 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 we should do is form a committee to or subcommittee in the same way that we have with the vehicle conditions review to look at it. And if you'd be happy to come on that committee, I'm sure you've got a lot to, to offer. Or if anybody else is happy to, to come on to that committee, that's how we'll all work. But I just need an agreement in principle. I can send around further details to the licensing committee later on. But if we're all happy for me to, to go ahead and do that work and then send you all an email with further information, that's great. Okay, well, in that case, thank you very much for that. We shall move on to agenda item number eight, which is the date and time of the next committee meeting, which is Friday, the 26th of May. 2023 at 11 a.m. Okay, thank you very much.